uh, a fairly full schedule, and I'd like to be able to try and stay on time as much as possible. Please come right on in. I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, 2017 Candidates Night. This is sponsored, as probably most of you know, by the Chase uh, Key Association. We started doing this almost 20 years ago. I was looking this information up and discovered it was actually about, um, we've done this since 1994, I think, is uh, when they actually started the process. And of course, the goal is to provide an opportunity for the community to meet the candidates and learn a little bit more about their platforms, what they stand for, and give you an opportunity to ask some questions. So that's basically what we are here for. This evening we have uh, as our moderator, Mr. Fred Bartenstein, who uh, is a longtime Yellow Springs resident. He has a telephone history in bluegrass music and broadcasting, so he is uh, quite apt to be able to control us. Uh, there are some basic pieces of information that Fred's going to share with you at this time, and then um, and when we get into the questioning part, I'll come back and give you a little bit more specific. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're, as you can see, we're going to start with the school board, and we're going to work for an hour with the school board candidates, and then switch the stage and have the mayoral candidates. The candidates will be presented in alphabetical order within each group, and each candidate will be given five minutes to make an initial introductory presentation. Mr. Harris, will wave a three-minute sign when you have three minutes to go. And when you reach five minutes, you will hear this sound. Which gives you a pretty clear, a pretty clear message of what you do at that point. Uh, following the presentation of candidates for specific office, members of the audience will be given an opportunity to submit written questions to any candidate or all of the candidates. And there are volunteers passing around through the audience. I already have one question. Uh, and if you would like to, she will have some pencils too? Pencils? Okay. So if you would like a card to write a question, wave to the volunteer. And when uh, you're ready for it to be collected, hold it up in the air and the volunteers will bring those questions to me. Um, the response to any question will be limited to one minute. And Mr. Harris will ring that cowbell after one minute is up. If I, as the moderator, think the question needs to be clarified and an opportunity provided for another answer, in my sole judgment, the candidate will be, might be given more time to respond. So those are the ground rules. They are pretty simple. And the two questions that the school board candidates are, have been asked to address in their presentations to you are, in your opinion, what are the two most important issues a newly elected school board member should address while in office? And, what ideas do you have to address these issues? We'll begin with Steve Kahn. And there's a microphone there. Can you all hear me if I No, use the mic. Oh, Please use the mic. Please use the mic. I'm getting a lot of feedback on that mic. Well, thank you very much to the key people for organizing this forum yet again. And yes, I'm Stephen Kahn. I'm currently serving as a member of your Yellow Springs School Board. And I want to start by saying uh, that it's been a real privilege and an honor to do so for the last four years. I have found this to be one of the most collegial, one of the most collaborative, and one of the most effective boards I've ever served on. And so I need to thank my fellow board members for that, as well as especially Board President Ayanna Mohammed, who's sitting here on the stage with me. Let me begin my uh, response to the questions by saying, as many of you I am sure know, there has been an enormous amount of tremendously good news that's come out about the schools over the last several years. You are aware of much of it, I'm sure. The, uh, we've done very well recently in the US, US News and World Report rankings. Our McKinney Middle School team was recently 
uh, de designated the best in the state uh, among state middle schools. Uh, and said maybe the, the most uh, dramatic measure of how exciting things are right now in our schools is that several dozen school districts have sent faculty and administrators here to Yellow Springs to look at what we're doing, to study the innovations that we're pioneering here in order that they can take them back to their districts. Uh, I think this is a very exciting time for the school and it's been, uh, it's been really fun to watch this happen. So, two challenges. Uh, that's my, my charge right now. Let me uh, start by saying that I do not believe we have what I would call reliable partners in the educational venture at the state or federal level. And this has created all kinds of challenges for the board and for the administration. We uh, are subject to sometimes unpredictable, sometimes indeed onerous uh, edicts, mandates, requirements that rain down either from Columbus or from Washington, often without warning or explanation, and we have to tack and adjust accordingly. This can include, uh, you know, the changes to the state graduation requirements that have happened twice in the last three years, regimes of standardized testing that come and go and come again without explanation, and so we have to uh, deal with that. That is a, a challenge I certainly did not expect to find when I began my service on the school board uh, four years ago. Which leads to my second challenge, because one of the ways in which we do not have predictable partners in our educational project is, uh, is, is about the financing, it's about the money. Financing, I think, is always a challenge uh, for schools, especially in a district as small as ours in a system which is disproportionately reliant on local property taxes to fund education, we're squeezed. And the board is fully aware of that. I am fully aware of that as well. State and federal money comes and it goes. Uh, the, the state may, in fact, give us a little more than we project in a given year. They may give us less than we project. We got an email out of the blue this summer uh, to discover that much of our Title I funding from Washington was simply eliminated. We didn't know that was kind of every district in the state got that email, pulled out of the blue. So we have to scramble to deal with that. So how does the board respond? Well, the primary job of the school board is to supervise and direct the superintendent and the treasurer, and to make sure that they are implementing the strategic plan which the board passed in 2011 after it was produced through a collaborative community process. So in, this, in the face of what I'll call these state and federal headwinds, the board gives the superintendent the space to experiment with solutions. We encourage him to think creatively so that we can fulfill what we must fulfill while also educating our kids in ways that we think are best for them and which reflect the values of this community. We are also responsible for making sure that we run as tight a financial ship as possible, and we are doing that. We educate our children at a lower per pupil cost than many comparable districts in the region and the state, but we're also looking at ways of raising additional money, one of the primary priorities of that strategic plan, and some of those efforts are now beginning to bear some fruit. So I'll wrap up by saying again, I think our schools are doing a great job producing fearlessly thinkers, and it's been a real pleasure to be a small part of that over the last four years. Thanks very much. Um, good evening. I'd like to thank the McKee Association for the many years of hosting the Candidates Forum. These forums enrich our community in ways that money cannot. Thanks to Karen McKee for organizing this event and to Fred Bartenstein for being our moderator. Our community is considered a community of high opportunity because of a few factors that include our good schools, personal safety, and stable housing. That's why I moved here 20 years ago. But in order for me as a single mom to afford the rent in my 1960s ranch in IGA land, I put in 60 to 80 hours a week. A few years later, we built a barn and I live in it. We did that to bring down our housing costs. This made it possible for me to work less hours and to be with my family a little bit more. 
We're all feeling that crunching of rising housing costs these days. In the past 30 years, we've lost 50% of our African American population as our housing costs have risen. We're also losing families with children. Our average household size is only 2.3 now. Only 3% of our population is under the age of five, and that's our pipeline to school. 54% of us are over 45, and that's the pipeline to retirement. 21% of us have already retired. And our 30% of us are on fixed incomes. 50% of our renter families pay more than 30% of their monthly income. And I've talked to families that are paying 50% of their monthly household income just to stay in our town. Our schools should critically look where we need to improve. The state says we need to improve several areas, including how we educate our most vulnerable students. And they tell us that we spend 67% of our education dollars directly in the classroom on instruction. The district released its own report and called it, called it the quality profile and they point to the U.S. News and World Report, which Steve pointed out, that ranks us in the top 25 of the Ohio schools. Even that report placed our ranking of preparing our students for college at 53, while the top five districts ranked above 80. In the past 30 years, oh, I already made that part. Um, this is good news from a management point of view. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity to improve. So how do we do it? I think first we must accept that while we're good, we still need improvement. We also need to understand our demographics, which I pointed out to you. And as Steve pointed out, in 2011 they made a plan. We've got new data. We should work with that new data. We should never move on a plan that's five years old when we've got data that's a year old that tells us something different. I'm a planner and I work with data every day and there's not a single moment, I'm deviating, there's not a single moment that I would give my county commissioners that I work for um, an opportunity to work against a plan unless I had data to support that and I give them that data. So far, the board has supported a new way of delivering education to our students in the form of project-based learning and it is, um, may take some time to see the fruits of that effort. Last year, a paper was published out of the University of Minnesota on some PBL outcomes that says that students who already show a great deal of initiative are very successful with the model. According to the study, though, students who don't have focus or agency to take initiative don't do as well with that model. So are we closing the gap with our new model? Let's make sure we put in place metrics that allow us to measure that earnestly and apply the necessary elements to close the gap. Because our main mission here is to educate our students. Does increased spending in the classroom uh, produce better results? I don't know, let's see some literature on that. As a community, we should do this. And not necessarily pay consultants, but we can do this with our own research skills. We're full of consultants in this time. Does putting our kids in new buildings improve the results? I can say with some surety that it probably does, but at what cost? Our most, our most vulnerable students often come from lower income households. If we raise taxes too high, we will certainly displace some of those lower income families and replace them with more affluent households who will bring their own educational advantages with them. We will also displace seniors on fixed incomes. Is this how we want to close the gap? Conversely, is our existing buildings preventing students from improving? And if so, at what cost? We need to answer these questions as a community, all of us, together. Four years ago, while I slept in my metal barn house on High Street, shots rang out from two houses away. My neighborhood was told to shelter in place while a SWAT team rolled a tank past my house and down my neighbor's driveway. I've yet to replace those porch lights that got busted out that night, because every time I come home, they remind me of how fragile life is. And why? It's really important to be with our family. Let's let our parents be with their families and not work 80 hours a week. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Steve McQueen. Hello. Uh, of course, first I'd like to thank the James A. McKee group for putting this on and giving me the opportunity to really get out there and, and talk to the people. 
Um, that is that's really key, because as the youngest person running, and as my first time running, I'm sure a lot of you don't know who I am. So in case you may only think of me as the guy who plays cards with Tim in front of Emporium, or maybe some of us who may be seen at the Culture Pages, since 2014, when I first uh, started HRC, the Human Relations Commission, which I held two titles, Secretary and Treasurer. From there, I did Community Voices, which you may hear in the Community Events Calendar, which is me. Actually, my last one will be uh, tomorrow, unfortunately. <clears throat> and from there, I've, I've been on the Justice System Task Force, which I'm Secretary of now. And, uh, Proud member of Central Chapel, which I am the drummer, and once in a while we get on a good thing. Sunday singing. Um, and I can go on and on, but really also want to stress the fact that I am a newlywed. And it's in my lovely wife and family who are here. And uh, my family is the main thing that leads me to the next point, which is I have a family now. And schools are extremely important at one in third and one in seven. And hopefully, <laughs> we may be looking at a younger McQueen coming up. And so I'm really looking towards the future of these schools. And I'm very dedicated to the concept of, I'm also a board member of Home Inc. and the concept of affordability in this town right now. There are, there are numerous people coming to me saying, Gosh, we're like one or two decisions for me having to figure out where I'm going to move. There's also families that come visit saying, ah, we looked at a house and then the moment we heard what it's going to be, we, heard, we can't even think about that. And so the last thing we need is that it's the school board's reason for them, for the, the cost of why we're here is so high. Basically, I put it on the level of if we have state-of-the-art schools but no kids to put in there, what is the point? We really need to start thinking about the concept of we already have great schools. We've already heard from both. The schools here are fantastic. The, <laughs> the schools here are fantastic. We already know this. <clears throat> you guys already know this. The question is the parts that aren't working, as in the structures. What, what can we do? What will we do? The main thing that we must focus on is that whatever we do, we work as a community to make sure that we make it the best that it can be. And I feel like sometimes that gets lost of a, uh, well, if they think this or you think that, then don't be splitting. No, there's a compromise somewhere. And we need to start thinking about what's going to affect the parent, what's going to affect the teacher, and what's going to affect someone who lives nowhere near their schools, or the person on the fixed income, that really the last thing they need is you telling them that now their taxes are going up, and that's really on you. The decision that needs to be made, we need all of your input. For me to stand up here and say this must be done without your input would be a terrible idea. I need you to tell me what it is I'm going to do as a school board member, and so I'd like to finish by saying that Regardless, <clears throat> I do believe we're still going to do really well, but I hope that you give me the opportunity with youth, age, color, whatever it may be for the reasons why, that I'm going to do it with your best interests at heart. Thank you very much. Finally, we'll hear from Aida Berhemming. Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the McKee Group for always graciously hosting this event. Appreciate that. Um, my name is Aida Merhemek. I've been a resident of Yellow Springs since 1986 and a school board member for 12 years, as well as a school board member of the Annan School for seven years before that. I'm a business owner in town. My husband and I own the Yellow Springs Psychological Center, which is above the Wings Restaurant, which has been established here since 1986. My main focus is on educating children and creating captivating schools that our children want to attend. It is our obligation to support our students' development by offering a variety of learning opportunities, both academic and experiential enabling them to be creative, critical thinkers and problem solvers of real life challenges. 
Our current curriculum of project-based learning anchors an adaptable learning environment, which I believe fosters each student's growth and development. By emphasizing real-life experiences, hands-on learning, and social-emotional understanding, I believe students have a more authentic learning experience, integrating their personal learning with more formal education, encouraging them to embrace their education and their learning makes school more meaningful and gives them opportunities for real ownership and responsibility. It becomes, or really already is, their journey, which we have helped to guide and support. We, the adults, are their gateway into the yet unknown possibilities of what's next and what's possible. I would be negligent if I didn't express my gratitude to our teachers, our staff, and our administrators who do the hard work every day. They are fearless lifelong learners themselves and can't be applauded enough for their commitment and dedication. And finally, to you, our voters, who understand we are educating future leaders and innovators and have consistently supported our children and the education in this district. Thank you. Yellow Springs voters have overwhelmingly supported education for decades, even dubbing the village an education village. Historically and with great pride, we've been prudent and financially resourceful. Presently, both the village and the district are addressing critical infrastructural demands, resulting in a heavy burden on all of us taxpayers. It is incumbent for the school board to thoroughly consider both the near and long-term costs and considerations and consequences of each of these facility options. In 2011, the Board of Education committed to and implemented the strategic plan. That plan was thoughtfully authored by many, many constituents in our village, and it has guided the board successfully since its inception. The plan calls for the board to address facilities life cycles, and that's what we're doing in earnest. And in order to do that in earnest, we include your voices, because we believe we need to hear from all of you. We have had an engagement process that began actively with the community in March of this year. However, the boards discussed this beginning in the fall of 2016. There have been five public meetings, three facilities action committee meetings, which have included a variety of stakeholders. And currently, a professionally constructed phone survey is being executed by Wright State's Applied Policy Research Institute. As a current school board member, I want to assure you that the board has not made any decisions regarding facilities. We are, in fact, still continuing to educate ourselves while also digesting all the current concerns, feedback, and objections raised by our community. Although we might not be able to resolve all the issues being brought forward, I do trust we will continue to take community concerns into account as we strive to make the best decision possible for our students and our community's future. Ultimately, no plan will proceed without the approval of new voters. In my tenure as a board member, I've always taken community opinion seriously and have never taken community support lightly. I respect children and my background and commitment to them has shaped my career and my community service for a very long time. My desire to support, guide, and empower them drives my dedication and commitment and makes me want to continue in one of the most honorable positions I can imagine. I hope you'll consider me for re-election. Some of you came in after I uh, read the ground rules. We are now going to move into the questions and answers for the school board candidates. The questions are to be placed in writing on index cards. If you'd like an index card or a pencil, raise your hand. There are volunteers uh, moving through the audience. There's a hand over here. Um, and then when you finish writing out your question, put it up in the air again and the volunteer will pick it up. Uh, the candidates will have one minute to respond. And Mr. Harris will ring the bell. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> the first que after that minute, the first question is for Dawn Johnson. Ms. Johnson, in person and on social media, you seem to be extremely critical 
of our elected representatives on village council and school board. If elected, how do you plan to collaborate with your colleagues? That's a great question. I think critical thinking is an important part of learning. I hope we're teaching that to our children. We cannot always go along to get along. If we have information that indicates that the way the group is moving is a group think sort of way, or the way the group is, is behaving isn't, isn't taking into account all the information that's out there. I'm going to speak up about that. That's just what I do. I cannot go along with information, or I can't go along with a story that information contradicts. And that's just how I'm always going to be. I, I hope you can appreciate that. The second question, Dawn, is also for you. What experience do you have in boardsmanship on public or private boards? Very little. I'm a background person. I am the GIS coordinator for Warren County, and most of my activity is bringing data to decision makers. I give them the reams and reams of data that they need to make quality decisions for their community. I believe that I can collab collaborate with a board. I have worked with other uh, agencies in the past. I've been on your planning commission for five years. Um, but I, again, I'm going to bring data. I'm going to do a lot of research, and I'm going to bring that to the board uh, so that they can uh, be aware of uh, data that's maybe beyond their, uh, beyond their normal scope of, of vision. The next question is both for Steve. Uh, it just says Steve. There are two Steves. That's true. Steve uh, Steve too. Right. Malta, which Steve are you asking? Which one? The candidates who are running for the first time. Okay, so this is for Steve McQueen. Uh, Steve, have you scheduled time to sit down and formally meet with the superintendent and the principals? Uh, yes, I've already met with the uh, superintendent and uh, I've had a couple of conversations. And I personally met with the principals, not necessarily um, only to speak about um, basically what the roles are and how I could learn, we could learn from each other. I'm definitely going to do that with the principals, but I definitely have already done that with the superintendent. And Dawn, the same question for you. Have you scheduled time to sit down and formally meet with the superintendent and principal? Um, Mario and I have discussed sitting down, but I haven't made an actual schedule. I have sent the treasurer, however, an email to schedule some time to speak with her um, concerning her five-year forecast. Steve McQueen, have you attended any of the Ohio School Board candidate <coughs> workshops? Uh, yes, I actually went to the one in uh, the month before October. September. <laughs> um, I went to one in September, and it was to it was basically all about um, basically how to run, and then also what would be your beginning what were the beginning steps of being on the school board. So um, that was actually at the OSBA Ohio School Board Association, and I went there in Columbus in September. Dawn, have you attended any of the Ohio School Board candidate workshops? I've not attended any workshops personally. I've looked at their uh, materials. This is a question to all four candidates. Please address the apparent resistance by the school administration to have an independent building inspection. Dawn, since you have the microphone, you can start. I think an independent building inspection uh, with a qualified uh, building uh, inspector, not necessarily an architect, but someone who inspects buildings on a regular basis, it would be a valuable thing to, to have done. I don't believe the OFCC um, is necessarily thinking about our bottom line when they are looking at the building cost. When they tell us a 10-year-old air conditioner needs to be replaced, I have to question what else in their uh, inspection review uh, was premature. Steve McQueen. Please address the apparent resistance by the school administration to have an independent building inspection. I believe we should also have an independent um, inspection. And uh, 
because what's, what, you know, you should always get a second opinion. I just believe that, yes, but, um, I'm not sure what the resistance is, so I will admit that, um, but the concept of a, an independent, um, independent uh, inspection, I think, yeah, is necessary. Aida, please address the apparent resistance by the school administration to have an independent building inspection. Um, I'm not sure there's apparent resistance. I think we just haven't gotten all the information we need at this point. I think it's really important that we have a school inspector if we should go down that road because schools are very different than any other kind of building. Um, and we need to pay attention, serious attention, to any kind of legal liability. Um, and my understanding is that it would also be quite expensive. So there are options. We can have a traffic engineer look at our traffic situation. We've decided to do this survey, um, and we could decide to have another um, second opinion, but all of these things are costly, so they have been prioritized. And Steve Kahn, please address the apparent resistance by the school administration to have an independent building inspection. Do I get a minute or do I just get 15 seconds before the bell goes off? You have one minute, minute by four? Or? You're using that minute now. So I don't think there is any resistance and I don't think there, uh, we have had an independent assessment of our buildings. I think there's a misconception about what the School Facilities Commission does. The people who inspected our building uh, were an architectural and engineering firm from Toledo. The OSC has no particular interest one way or another in the decision that we as a community make about what we do with our buildings. They've worked with 400 plus school districts around the state using this process. And of course the great advantage to the process for districts is that this inspection gets done by an independent architectural firm contracted with the school's facility commission, but it's free to the district. So we can look at the information they gather, we can make some evaluations of it, but we've already had what amounts to an independent assessment of our buildings. And I think rather than getting hung up on the price tags that are listed in, those, uh, in, in that report, and if you haven't read it, it makes terrific bedtime reading, all 100 pages of it, um, I think the takeaway from this is that there are parts of our school buildings, both facilities, there are parts of those buildings that are simply not in good shape, and there's really no way to, uh, to get around that. Now, does that mean they're all in terrible shape or all parts of it are in terrible shape? Not necessarily, but I think um, what I get to take from that report is not so much. There we go. Okay. Would you pass the mic to Aida? Aida, it has been suggested that the community should trust its school board. You have served on the board for many years. How, during your watch, have the physical facilities deteriorated so much? Um, well, I'm not sure, uh, well, I think with age and with usage, but I'm not sure they've deteriorated so much. I think that they have been, they've been a deteriorated state for a long time. As I said in my introduction, we've been a prudent and fiscal village and uh, district. Uh, we've tried to uh, piecemeal our expenses and our costs in the best way we can. I believe that we've done that uh, very frugally and very carefully because we've had our taxpayers um, in mind and um, I think that we've done a pretty darn good job of trying to keep and maintain the buildings um, in the best possible ways we can. This is a question for Dawn. Dawn, you referred to new data to incorporate into the district plan. What is the new data and how would you incorporate it? As of 2011, the census has been releasing the American Community Survey, which gives us a snapshot of uh, how we're doing on an annual basis. And um, that data gets published. It's available on the census website. They've done a fantastic job of putting that data into a very usable um, format for the consumer. And we would use that data, just as I said, 3% of us are under the age of five, that's our pipeline for school. I think we should be considering that as we make projections about how many school, how many children are going to be in our school in um, over the, um, the matriculation of, of uh, K-12. So I think that that's one way that we would do it. There's a lot of other data that's, that's available in there, household data. They, they are telling us through uh, the census survey now you know, what our median income is, what our average income is, actual numbers, 
that are in different income brackets are available one year after um, the data comes to the census. So we're looking at 2015 data in 2016. So we knew in 2015 uh, how many people were employed. We knew in 2015 how many people were uh, were retired, how many people were receiving Social Security, and how much they were receiving. So we would incorporate all that information into our decision-making process, or at the very least, I would bring it to the board for that. The next, thank you. The next question is for the two incumbents. The school board appears to be very homogeneous. There is some concern in the community that the needs of the poor and minorities are not being addressed well. What would you do to change this? Can you affect change? I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. The constitution of the school board is decided by first who runs and then who's elected, and that's not really much anything at the school. So the, so the core of the question, Steve, yeah. is how are the needs of the poor and minorities being addressed? So this is something that we talk about both in public session and ex in executive session pretty regularly. I think that members of the board right now um, are particularly concerned with questions of school climate uh, that have popped up over the last, let's call it 12 or 18 months, uh, with our capacity to recruit and maintain not only a diverse student body, but also a diverse faculty. Um, this is a real challenge. Uh, I think that there um, are more, there's, there's more socioeconomic diversity in the entire student body than I think many people realize, and we're very attentive to that. Aida, uh, please speak to how the needs of the poor and minorities are being addressed. So, um, I worked with Don Wallace, John Gudgel, and Joan Chappelle for many, many years uh, to try to bring forward and try to engage our entire student population um, with a lot of uh, sort of fine-tuning around what we could do to empower our population and especially our diverse population who perhaps weren't feeling like they might be included um, in day-to-day -day programming and in extracurriculars and so forth. We became quite successful over time with Girls' Night, Boys' Night, and now we have a Student Day of Empowerment where we bring people in, um, and we have been bringing people in. Um, we had a diversity person from Wright State in, we've had people from Wittenberg in, um, and we've really been trying to educate all of our students um, about how they could feel and be empowered. Um, in these breakout sessions, we learned a lot about how many of our students didn't feel like there was such a thing as racism or sexism or ageism in our community. Um, and, you know, I'm incredibly excited by this group called the Young People of Color who has emerged because I feel like the work, the groundwork we did is showing some momentum and some real life. And that is what I've done as a school board member to try to promote diversity and looking at how we might benefit our diverse and poor population. We have 21, we have 21 minutes left uh, for the school board portion. So I'm, the, most of the rest of the questions are addressed to, the, to everyone. So I'll ask you to show a hand if you'd like to answer the question. And maybe let's try to just have two answers. The first two hands I see will be the ones I call on. Reference our school buildings. What are your feelings about new construction versus refurbishing our current buildings? Dawn? Regarding new construction versus refurbishing our old buildings, the upstream waste and the downstream waste of tearing down these buildings and building new in this particular age when we don't know whether or not we'll be sending our dollars to Puerto Rico to help our families there or to Ireland to help our families there as crisis after crisis finds itself you know, in front of us. Our climate is changing at an incredibly rapid rate and we can't predict, our models are not predicting 
any longer uh, in a reasonable kind of way what we can expect tomorrow. It's 80 degrees outside and it's October 20th. How could we possibly think about building new buildings anew when we should be thinking about how to make do with what we have? I don't want to sound crisis. I don't want to sound like there's a, a horrible crisis about to drop on Yellow Springs, but we just don't know. And to behave in any way other is, I think it's arrogant. I saw Steve's hand next. How do you, what are your feelings about new construction versus refurbishing our current buildings? I really believe that <clears throat> it's up to the, the town itself to figure out where it wants to go. As in, if we just renovate, you know, that would save us now. But if we do build a one large school in one location, that would save numerous amounts in the future. Uh, so the thing is, uh, to say that one could be better than the other really does depend on how we want to budget and what we plan to do with this budget and with the students. Are we going to have enough students to fill both of these schools in the future? Or is this going to be too expensive? So we, uh, we have to figure out that question ourselves and say, what are we willing to pay for? Um, I believe both can work once again, as long as the town's willing to, to work for it and, and fund it. But if we can't fund it, then we have to figure out what our best option is for the students, the teachers, the parents, the town, for everyone. Like we, the decision that has to be made is basically it's going to be on all of us. It is how I feel about it. The, the next question is also addressed to everyone, and the first two hands I see will we'll get to answer it. Yellow Spring Schools practices a project-based learning curriculum. Do you support this method of teaching? And if not, what alternative methods would you recommend? <laughs> Aida and Steve Kahn. Aida, first. Uh, I very much support project-based learning. I think from uh, my introduction, you uh, got the sense that you know, hands-on experiential learning, I think, is really important in terms of student engagement and student success. And uh, just in regards to responding to an article that Don quoted, um, my experience has been, and sort of uh, what I've read, is that it actually levels the playing field for many, many students because we tap into a lot of their abilities and opportunities that in traditional classrooms we don't see or hear or uh, are a witness to um, students being engaged in those kinds of ways. So I'm a, I'm a very big supporter of that and I feel like kids have a lot more choice and as I suggested that they can take on ownership of their learning. A lot of the initiative comes from them and um, it also gives students the opportunity to collaborate and really be involved with their classmates in different sorts of ways that weren't possible when they we're engaging in traditional education. Steve Kahn, do you support project-based learning? And if not, what alternative methods do you recommend? So I'm going to tag team with Aida a little bit. I was a part of that uh, community committee that authored the 2020 strategic plan, and which was ratified by the board in 2011. It's a 10-year strategic plan. And one of its major points was to implement this, implement this curriculum innovation that we call PBL or project-based learning. So I was part of the group that helped shape this in the first place. As a board member, I'm now very pleased to be watching it implemented uh, across the grades, and I think it's showing really some tremendous results. I think maybe the best way to answer that question, if you are confused, skeptical, or um, are, are a little confused about what's going on, is to talk to uh, faculty and students. The faculty uh, now in both buildings are overwhelmingly um, in favor of this curricular innovation. And if you engage with our students uh, at one of the exhibition nights, I think you'll see the enthusiasm that they, are, uh, that they have now uh, doing the work that they're doing uh, through the project-based learning uh, uh, curriculum. This next question is for all the candidates. The first two hands I see will answer it. It doesn't seem like there is a strong program to discourage students from smoking, drinking, and dangerous drugs. What is your plan for this? Aida? 
Well, I don't have a personal plan, but I can tell you from the experience I have had working at Girls' Night and Boys' Night that those particular programs are constantly addressed as part of those programs. And during our Day of Empowerment last year, which was the first time we did it for a full school day so that all students could attend, um, that was also part of that. So um, in terms of addressing it, I think they ad I'm pretty sure they address it in their curriculum. Um, I'm not a curriculum person, but um, I, I believe that gets addressed quite frequently in, in coursework and in um, classes throughout the school year. Dawn, uh, what is your plan for discouraging students from smoking and drinking and dangerous drugs? I'm a proponent of um, a kind of learning method called recall. And basically, uh, when students, people, have a bad habit, it's a groove. And you have to replace that groove with something new. And so it's that learning method where rather than just saying you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't do drugs, we get kids to actually say themselves, I shouldn't drink because I do crazy stuff and I can't remember what I did the next day. And they say they do this over and over in conversation with one another. And those are the kinds of methods that researchers are finding actually help. It's like cognitive behavioral therapy. It actually helps change that group pattern from a bad habit and replace it with a good habit. And I think that's something that we should look at uh, in our schools. And that's something that, um, you know, even me as a citizen would recommend that the schools do. This question is also for all candidates. I'll look for the first two hands. What would you need to know or do before you would be ready to make a decision on the future of the school facilities? <coughs> well, again, let me let me address first a process confusion, uh, which I which I've heard a lot. The way this process will work is that the superintendent will present a proposal to the board. So in some ways, that's where this will generate should this process move forward. He has a variety of options. He can decide not to, uh, in which case the board will vote on nothing. He can present uh, one of the several options which are uh, available on, our, on the school website, and the board will then vote up or down on that. What I think I would need to know uh, in order to make such a decision is what the um, what the uh, 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 capacity is to pass this levy uh, should it go forward? I think, and I think I'm going to echo what Steve said. I would want to have the best sense I could that the plan we would put before voters would have the widest possible support of the voters uh, before we would vote um, on it. Don Johnson, what would you need to know or do before you would be ready to make a decision on the future of the school facility? I would need to know what the community could bear. What could you possibly afford? What could you give up in your day-to-day -day budget? How much money could you squeeze out of your pocketbook to keep these schools in good order? And why haven't we done that so far? Why didn't the schools come to us a few years ago when they noticed a crack in the floor or they had a, a leak that they didn't have in their budget and ask us for another million dollars? Why didn't that happen then? It's not the superintendent's responsibility to come forward with this. This is the board's responsibility to say, we've got a problem here and we need to do something about it. We should be the visionaries here, not the superintendent. He's, he does our chores for us. He does our work for us as the board. It's the board's responsibility to make sure that stuff gets done. The, the next question... And I need to know what you can bear. The next question is for Aida. Aida, how do you feel about term limits? Not to say you aren't doing a good job, but isn't it a good idea to hear from new voices? Absolutely. And um, I, I would encourage you, if you don't want me to uh, be a school board member, not to vote for me. Um, I, I do believe that new voices and new energy and new ideas is really, really important. Again, I feel committed and dedicated to our students and to the kids of Yellow Springs. And at this point, I have historical knowledge and expertise that I am willing to share with everybody here. Um, but 
you know, hey, if you don't want to vote for me, that's up to you. Um, all I can do is offer you what I know, and if that's not what you're looking for, then please, by all means, I, I don't mind change. So if that's what you prefer, uh, I'm all for it. If you prefer to have somebody who has some knowledge and expertise, um, I'm here too. So, you know, that's all I can say to that. The next question is for all candidates. I'll recognize the first two hands. What strategies do you recommend for attracting and retaining highly qualified teachers to our schools? Steve Kahn. I think there are a couple of answers to that question. Uh, one of which is that these schools are places where faculty can continue to develop in their own skills and their own intellectual uh, ways. We have to, and we have given space for faculty to do that. Along with that is the space and freedom to, to do what they want to do uh, and what they're good at in the classroom. I think one of the things you know that happened over the regime of No Child. Wait, that wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay. uh, one of the things that happened during the you know the years of No Child Left Behind is that teachers simply became administrators of tests, uh, and I think that killed the enthusiasm of a lot of teachers. Uh, I think you saw actually an exodus out of the profession altogether. We want to be the opposite of that. We want this to be a place where teachers can come uh, and experiment, and maybe sometimes the experiments fail, but we're going to support them because, uh, because they're trying to do the best and right thing by the kids. And I think that's the way we create uh, an environment which, uh, in which we attract and retain the best faculty. Does anyone else want to answer what strategies should we use to attract and retain highly qualified teachers? Steve McLean. Once again, uh, first off, the schools themselves, I think, uh, can do a pretty good job of leaving them here. But uh, of getting them here, I believe it's the community that keeps them here. And so we're talking about maintaining. Now, of course, I do believe when it comes to maybe getting teachers of color, I do believe maybe the school board can maybe do some more outreach that may be not being done, because um, that is something that people have been saying they'd really like to see. And so that's something I would really like to do if given that opportunity. Um, however, maintaining, usually when I talk to teachers about it, it's always that the parents really care. And the, the parents come in and then they'll go to the game and oh my God, the whole community showed up. And they're like, it's those little things like that that really make, you know, of course, what's, what they're getting paid and how they're going to live is really important as well, but I tend to find that a major aspect too. <clears throat> is knowing that, wow, I, I can talk to anybody here who I feel like part of the community, even if I live here or not. The next question is for everyone. How do we balance what we want to give our children with what we can afford to give them? Steve Kahn? Well, again, I'll, I'll just stress that what the school board is going to do and what we have been doing now for a number of months is exploring a variety of options. But ultimately, you all are the ones who will decide whether the option we have come up with uh, is, um, is feasible or not, uh, whether we can afford it or not. That's your choice to make. I think um, one of the other ways to think about the question, balancing what do we want versus what, what do we um, what can we afford, is to say, uh, do our children deserve this? Um, and I think when you walk through uh, certain parts of both buildings, or you're in some of these classrooms uh, where, where the systems aren't working, um, I think that's, it's hard to answer affirmatively, that, that our kids uh, deserve the buildings that they're in right now. And I think that's something that weighs heavily uh, on, on the board altogether is that, um, is that these school buildings are not in great shape and so the question becomes what's best for the future uh, of the kids we have now and the future kids that are going to come through our buildings uh, for subsequent generations. Don, how do we balance what we want with what we can afford? There's a lot of new research out, uh, again, from the world of psychology that talks about grit and it talks about how students actually learn and do better when they are challenged in their environment. If children are given a glide path, 
and everything's handed to them. When they go out in the world, they don't know how to respond to those difficult situations of that cranky boss or that, or that professor who doesn't give them the grade that they think they deserved. And I think this is one of those times when we can help them. And maybe it's a big PBL project where we talk about what can we do with the buildings that we have now to make them better for you as you're here with what little that we have. And I think that would be a great opportunity for our whole community to practice PBL. This is a question for everyone. Whatever decision is made regarding building or not, the community could be very divided. What would you do to reconnect and rebuild after a tough decision? Steve McQueen? This is basically what I'm mainly talking about is trying to to make sure that that divide doesn't get to a point where either nothing gets done or only one side feels that they got something and everyone else is now talking about that they want to leave. And my dad's a pastor and so it, everything has always been about how do you maintain the flock? And it's always getting, if there's something you don't know, there's always something, if there's something you don't know, find that whoever does know how to do it and ask for help and any help they can give. And this is something where instead of allowing us to divide us, why can't we find, well, if we figure that the best option is going to be like that the schools are further than people expected, well, then let's figure out how we're going to get people who can't get their kids out there, out there, or in here, or whatever it may be. But the concept of working together is more important than the decision half the time. We need to start thinking about the concept of why is it divisive and how can we make it less divisive? Is it really divisive? What can we do as a community to make sure it's not? If it costs this, how can we make it not cost that? Or who can give to who so that it doesn't, so that no one feels they're losing, no one ends up feeling like they're going to win? Aida, what would you do to reconnect and rebuild after a tough decision? Um, well, I'm hoping that uh, there won't have to be a whole lot of rebuilding because I feel like the community, uh, we are listening to the community. I believe that whatever proposal the superintendent brings to the board will be a well thought out and community oriented proposal. And that again doesn't mean that everybody's going to be satisfied. But I really, really trust and I really hope that by the time a proposal does get brought in front of us, that there is a lot more information out there, that there's a lot more um, understanding of the process, and a lot more, uh, um, not just understanding, but uh, words not coming to me, but a lot more experience in terms of us communicating with one another and getting the information we need to make a really well thought out a uh, decision that won't hurt everybody, um, but will actually hopefully engage and um, promote what we're all looking for. Again, I think there's plenty of room for compromise. I think that's what we've done historically, and I think we can continue to do that. Um, I think this has been framed in a really negative way from the get-go. I think there's been a serious misrepresentation about uh, where this started, and I'm hoping that we can heal before the proposal comes out. This is going to be the last question for the school board candidates, uh, and then we'll need to move on to the mayor's candidates. Uh, I, there are more cards I know in front of me, but they all relate to topics that have been already been discussed. What should the schools do to improve the maintenance of the existing buildings? Please respond to concerns about currently having a maintenance department of one only. Dawn Johnson. So we used to have a, a really good maintenance person who was more than just a guy who painted the walls and, and uh, mopped the floors. Uh, he came to the boards um, and would let them know when they had um, issues that they needed to address. So I really think it's incumbent upon us to have the staff uh, in place who understand uh, facilities management, not just um, uh, just plain maintenance, but the actual management, understanding when uh, different items need to be exercised, valves, uh, different um, 
the light fixtures need to be replaced because the, the materials are unavailable. And I think there should be a maintenance schedule uh, for um, our facilities. I, I have a maintenance schedule in my house. I know when I need to, to do more than just change my filters. I know when I need to call in a technician once a year to make sure that in the dead of winter I'm not going to lose my heat. Steve Kahn, please respond to concerns about currently having a maintenance department of one only. What should we do to improve maintenance of buildings? So I guess I would want to stress that our maintenance crew, and we had somebody recently retire, um, they've actually done a really tremendous job given some of the challenges that they face. It isn't, I think, reasonable to expect that a maintenance person hired by a school district is going to be able to do major roofing repair, major HVAC repair, uh, plumbing problems. Um, they can do what they can do, and they've done really admirably. I think it, it disparages that crew a little bit to suggest that they haven't worked hard, again, within very tight financial uh, restraints uh, to keep our schools up and running as well as they have been, given all kinds of aging systems. I think the analogy with your home repair is simply wrong. Uh, your house does not experience 400 teenagers running through it on a daily basis since 1963. Will you acknowledge all of the school board candidates? Stretch. <laughs> <laughs> 